So um, this is the link to collaborate notes. I paste the chat window as well. Uh, if you scroll a bit down here, um, you see that there's attendee check-in from the first session, which is the one that we currently have. So feel free to um, add your information here if, if you like or if you want to. <clears throat> and I will start by doing this as a slideshow. And I'll try to not mess things too much. Right, so welcome everyone um, to the plenary, RDA plenary, the 22nd RDA plenary, uh, the virtual one. Um, this is the first of the two iterations of the FER for machine learning interest group um, sessions. Uh, the other one will take place on May 21st, uh, which is in about a week from today. Um, you can find the collaborative notes um, here in this link. I've also pasted the chat window and I'm going to paste the same text once again, just to be on the safe side. Uh, you can find the slides, sorry, you can find the slides also here. And because this is an RDA event, um, we are going to use the same meeting etiquette uh, provided by the Code of Conduct of RDA. Uh, if you haven't gone through it, I strongly recommend to go through uh, the link itself and read it um, for your own. Essentially, the key point is that um, you need to be mindful of the others, uh, be respectful of their opinions, and try to have uh, as much of a constructive discussion as possible. Um, in case of any code of conduct breaches, um, the process that you need to follow is indicated the code of conduct, and I will urge you to, again, go through these. Um, because this is a virtual event, um, I remind everyone again that this is recorded, so if you don't want your faces to show please uh, disable your, your video. Um, if you want to add any questions, please feel free to add them directly in the chat. Or if you want to speak directly, please raise your hand. I'll try to monitor this as much as possible. And of course, any thoughts and comments to the collaborative document are more than welcome. So um, with the uh, practical out of the way, I'll move then to the first part of the agenda. So this is our agenda for today. Uh, this is the first session, uh, which I think technically makes it the RDA break session two. Um, we are now in the welcome introduction, and I'm going to provide some also context on the um, interest group, the objective structure and cloud join. And then we'll move in with some updates from the two main task forces that are currently running, um, including a couple of uh, activities that we will ask all of you to participate and provide us some insights. In the second part, um, we're very happy that we are going to have an invited talk by Omar from Croissant, um, and we'll talk about uh, the metadata format for mla ready datasets, and then we'll wrap up the discussion with um, hopefully some key activities moving ahead uh, with the um, interest group itself. So, uh, launch. there we go. <clears throat> Thanks, Moran. I'll paste this once again. Um, so, yes, so now about the performance learning interest group. So the, this interest group has been, uh, was implemented, well, established, uh, I think a bit more than a year ago. And its main goal is to discuss how fair principles, aspects, elements can be applied to machine learning. And this includes, for example, what are the fair elements in the machine learning lifecycle, how the actual fair principles can and should be interpreted or applied to machine learning, what would be the metadata that are relevant to describe effective machine learning models, etc. So as you can understand, this is a quite broad context for the interest group. Um, and as such, the outcomes that we could possibly have as an industry are ranging quite far. Um, from use cases that are relevant here to the definitions of these different elements. Ideally, some recognition guidance documents on fairness for machine learning um, specifications, how to produce some outcomes, um, and ideally how to better connect um, the, uh, the outputs and activities of the interest group to networks and initiatives that are beyond um, beyond RDA, such as the Pistoli Alliance, Elixir, um, and similar initiatives. Um, 
in order to do that, uh, we've already started doing a catalog of the different projects and stakeholders that are um, that exist, which includes from platforms, communities, and projects. Uh, but of course, as you can easily imagine, this is not a exhaustive list, not even a complete one. So if there are other elements, other communities, other projects, other stakeholders that are relevant, uh, please feel free to either contact us or add them in, in, in our collaborative notes and we'll start tracking those as, as well. Uh, which brings to the question of how to join. Um, we have, of course, a SNRDA a mailing list. Uh, if you want to join the group, you'll probably start getting the emails, probably being um, due to the fact that we have now a VAMP website, which looks cleaner and more modern, but at the same time, it has some technical issues that we're still trying to go around with. Um, but ultimately, that's kind of the process, um, the following process for RDA. Join the group, uh, you only require registration for the RDA itself, which is free, and then you will be start receiving all the emails from then onward. Uh, we have monthly meetings on Zoom. Uh, on even months, we have them at 8 uh, UTC. Odd months, it's uh, 20 UTC. Uh, so we at least try to be um, as inclusive as possible of all time zones. And uh, we do send a reminder before each meeting to the main mailing list to ensure that people can participate and have the opportunity to provide any comments or feedback either before or after the meeting itself. Right now, we have two main task forces. The first task force nominally is focused on a white paper on fair things aligned to the machine learning lifecycle. And the second task force, and we'll provide some updates in the next few minutes, the second task force is about uh, defining a core metadata schema for machine learning models. Both of these have been running for quite some time now, um, and we're welcoming everyone who wants to join to please um, join any of these uh, activities. Um, ultimately, there is an asynchronous discussion, and we try to put information as much as possible throughout um, the month, not just during the monthly calls. Um, there are documents that are created in task forces that you can directly contribute. Mm -hmm. There's an open consultation right now from Task Force 2, and we have a GitHub space um, with some repositories and activities running there as well. Uh, I think that's kind of the quick version, and these are sort of the goals for today. We expect that um, we'll be able to review and discuss the different activities around the machine life cycle. Um, and of the activities that we have been running over the past few um, few months. Hopefully also um, linking to relevant projects that are active in this particular field. We're going to have a more in-depth discussion on the effort of the metadata for machine learning. This is the task two. And uh, we're also going to have some updates from relevant communities in this particular case uh, from Croissant. The main goal is to actually start, um, well, push further the work of the Fair Force Learning Interest Group, one for the machine learning life cycle and the metadata being the second. I think that's kind of the quick version. I'll do a short stop here in case there are any questions or any comments or any thoughts from the audience. I don't see anything in the chat. I pasted again uh, the minutes uh, document. I don't see any hands as well. Um, so I'll move then directly to task force one. So, and we are right on time, which is useful. So what is the overview of task force one? This is um, again, led primarily by um, a few of the chairs of the, of the industry group and the overall ambition, sorry, the whole ambition is to figure out how the fair principles can be applied to machine learning. So this is, as you can imagine, quite ambitious and also very broad in terms of how you define this ambition. Um, the main rationale driving this ambition is that if you start looking at different kind of um, elements like research software or workflows, the different implementation, different interpretations of the fair principles actually required some significant translation so that they can be applied to research software and workflows respectively. And this was an effort um, done also within the, the RDA, the research, um, the fair for research software working group actually was quite successful up front. Um, but this leaves a lot of other sort of um, elements um, hanging in this particular case, the resilient models. Um, there are a lot of people saying that, okay, 
but you can apply here and there similar cases, which the argument is that, well, if there are data, are they actually? Because we are talking about a set of parameters and options, if you look at the model, but it's not by itself static. It's not a data set as they are. Um, also, someone might say that it's a software because it can be um, an executable symbol, executable thing that you can have an input, you can have an output. Again, this is quite broadly defined. And there are some elements that you actually have a static binary file that is floating around and has some additional aspects, such as um, the, the, the weights of the model itself, which are defined in a different role. So can you see this combination of data software workflows? Sure, but then which parts need to have this application of the fair principles? How do you need to change that, et cetera? And if it's something else, what this, as this might be? So that's kind of the train of thought that led initially to the discussion of, okay, we actually need to have a more in-depth discussion about this. So the goal of this task force is to develop a white paper. And in order to achieve that, uh, we kind of gravitate to these particular steps. So they are ordered, but it's not necessarily in a very, it's not ordered by, by time. So the ones that do the literature review, what is already out there, what people have been doing uh, so far in this direction, uh, if someone do, does a quick um, look even now, you'll see that there are a few efforts already trying to tackle how FAIR can be relevant to AI or to machine learning or to both. Or we seem to have a little bit of a network issue. Yes, it looks like. So it's um, not just me who lost 40 right? It's a can, shared can, problem. <laughs> exactly. We can wait one minute for him to come back. Otherwise, um, I'll continue or Dan can continue. I think Fotis is an event that current, um, so he might have dodgy Wi Fi. seems like he disappeared completely. All right, well, in the meantime, um, uh, well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be presenting <clears throat> the second section of the working group later. Uh, but uh, I want to, I want to remind everyone of the notes and if there are any uh, you know, any suggestions or any, we, you feel like we have uh, forgotten a very important paper that was recently out and in our overview and in our work, uh, please let us know in the notes or just interrupt us and let us know at any point. Um, yeah, so Daniel, if, that... you, if you want to bring up the slides and kind of take us back to where we were, then I can, I can do the last little bit of, of task force one before you go on the two. All right, I can do that. Let me see if I can remove this. Um, so one second. That's first one. I can't remember exactly which slide was it. I think it was the uh, over here, no? Yeah, I, I, either that one or the one. Yeah, I think this one is where we, I, I think that's where we were. Um, yeah, sorry, so I'm, I'm Dan Katz from the University of Illinois. Um, also one of the co-leads of the group. Yeah, so the uh, so this task force was was intending to develop a white paper, and as Fotis was saying, I think when he was interrupted, we have these steps that aren't exactly in time order, but um, but all need to be done. And so if you go on, Daniel. Okay. So in terms of literature review, we are we are doing this. We have a, a Google Doc that has captured a bunch of things as well as a Zotero collection. And we're in the, the process now of doing um, a review of this and doing some notes uh, for Zachary. Um, I have to say, I'm actually not completely sure of the answer to that. That's a very good question, um, whether or not there is a 
notes document. Um, I, I think that's something I you need think to there is we have it in we have it as part of the uh, I think we have a Google Drive where we have started collecting uh, all these uh, notes and there is a link to uh, to the uh, white paper but uh, well I'll, I'll, I'll try I'm sharing my screen I cannot look it up right now but I will look it up just after I have some time. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. I'm uh, sorry, and I'm just looking at the Google Doc for the second as well. Um, I mean, so the, yeah, the Google Doc itself actually does have an outline of what the paper would look like, and um, but it's mostly notes at this point. And so, uh, yeah, I, I okay. So we'll 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 go on for the minute. Um, sorry, okay, I see we reappeared again. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, right. I have, I'm really sorry. I have no idea why my computer just decided to crash at this point. So, sorry. I mean, that's literally technical difficulties. And I assume I need to thank everyone for like picking up my slack from there. Um, I can continue sharing the screen if you like. So I can not burn any more with that. And again, sorry for, for this hiccup. <clears throat> Right. So um, I assume that this is not discussed. Um, the yeah. literature reviewer is sort of an effort that we are trying to capture what exists already in terms of, of uh, articles, but we also have a esoteric group to capture this kind of information as much as possible, but this is kind of an ongoing process. Um, the second um, step was to discuss a bit uh, about the machine learning life cycle. So this was a more comprehensive effort um, led by Zedmed and uh, Leila Garcia uh, Castro, um, which is um, was organized back in November. And the main goal of that was two sides. The first was to figure out what were the main um, activity, the main sorry, simplified version of the machine learning lifecycle and what do we mean by that? Um, the second being uh, essentially what are the cycles that we need to look into uh, when we start moving ahead. Um, I'll stick a bit more with this particular one because this is sort of the outcome that we had at that time. Um, and it was, uh, it, we had a few iterations back and forth um, over these three days on how this could look like. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll walk you through this process because it's going to be useful also for the activity that will coming up right ahead. So the first is that it comprises of like ten broadly defined steps, although they have links. As you can see, the 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 the, the stronger links, the more, the more broad lines, define the steps that usually go most of the time. The more um, thin lines correspond to cases that can be connected, but are not the, the usual case. Um, it is quite simplified. Um, and again, the main reason was to allow us to figure out what are the fair elements and how to connect those things. So we ignored a lot of activities and, and, and steps that are part of the machine learning lifecycle. In any case, like the publication, the monitoring, uh, life cycle of data and software that is involved in the process, and of course, the documentation itself. And this is just some of the things that we actively ignored, not for any other reason, but because some of those elements are um, either incorporated in, in other aspects like software, or um, they don't really add an additional layer of, of complexity in, in this model itself. So um, the model, well, the, the life cycle rather, starts with a problem definition. Um, basically, at that point, we want to define exactly what is the challenge that we want to do, why we want to define a model, what is the purpose of the model itself. Um, and the second point is um, after we have defined the model, um, we start gathering both the data, but also figure out what is the corresponding method that we need to select for that. So do you see that these steps two and four are basically more or less learning in parallel at that level. Um, the data gathering means that you need to identify and retrieve the information that is relevant. Data pre-processing might be making the data you collected AI ready. Uh, additionally, you might run some additional um, feature selection methods or um, software, pieces of software that will, uh, will facilitate that. Um, 
at the same time, as I said, you have the fourth method, which is to define, uh, to select the, the model itself. Um, and with the method in place, you can go ahead and actually run and, and create the model. Um, the sixth step is one of the things that we kind of discussed quite a bit um, because we have the model evaluation and the model validation. And, and this kind of a distinction was mostly in the, in the sense of the evaluation is more of the um, strict technical evaluation of whether a model adheres to particular accuracy or other parameters of the process itself. The validation is to check whether the outputs of the model actually solve the problem that was defined here. So that's why steps four, five, or six is basically repeated as much as needed, um, as opposed to the validation of the model, which can be run once. Um, and then depending on what can be improved, for example, a different method, you can go back and go through this process again. Um, the eighth step is the deployment monitoring. And this um, came to our mind um, thinking of cases or scenario where you have a machine learning model as part of a continuous pipeline. For example, I want to do weather prediction. And you have a model that allows you to do that based on continuous information. You have trained the model, you put this part of your system um, and you leave it there. At some point you want to replace that. So it means that you need to always monitor where, whether your model actually continues to perform as intended or whether you know, need to go back and retrain the whole process. So that's kind of step eight. At the same time, step nine is that you need to save and store the model. Um, this is effectively the st stage where you've done everything, you're happy with that, and you want to make sure that this is maintained somewhere in a repository, in a somewhere, ideally a repository or a particular relevant structure. Um, at the same time, most of the cases that now you have created the model, you actually want to share it. You may want to share it publicly, or you want to share it within collaborators or as a private within a particular um, community, but you might be not likely you want to share it. So these are the elements here. And the last part is essentially the only of those steps that is intended um, to the person or the group that was not actively involved in the creation of the model itself. So up until step nine, all of those steps were run by the same group, person, people that were defining this model, creating the model itself. Step 10 is the case where someone else comes in, takes the model that was stored and shared by the previous group and wants to reuse it. And then in that case, you might end want to go back to the process of data gathering, data processing, if you want to retrain it or fine tune it, et cetera. So that's kind of the life cycle that we've designed at the time. Um, and based on that, these 10 steps, the next effort that we tried to, to do was to see which of those steps, um, well, which of the fair data, fair software, and fair models, which is still to be decided at some point, and which of those elements fit across any of those steps. So um, for that, we already start an activity, and you can find the document here. But at the same time, we would like to have your as the community feedback on how this might work. So we have already planned an activity on that for the task force one, which roughly, well, I can stop sharing that one so I can go to the collaborative notes, which I'll stick here. Um, I saw that there was an issue with the screen, the sharing. I know if I can do that. Yes, so my apologies. I should be able to do that now. Sorry for that. I should have thought of that a bit earlier. Um, and here um, we have basically two questions. The one is that across all those steps, um, which are the four principles that are more relevant here? And um, which of those uh, are the more, well, critical or specific sub-elements of these four principles that are relevant here? Um, the second point, the second question is that with this kind of structure, what are we missing or if we're missing anything? And that might include additional steps <coughs> that are distinct in this particular life cycle. Or it could be uh, steps of the process, aspects of fairness that we have not yet considered, um, or basically any other feedback that you might, might uh, need to provide. So with that, um, I propose that uh, we work asynchronously on this. Um, everyone should have access to this document, I hope, I think. 
Um, so I'd like to ask you directly to put your comments in there across all these points. Um, if you want to add your name as initials or anything, that's fine. It's easier for us to acknowledge your contributions here. If you want to be fully anonymous, that's equally fine. I don't think that there is a particular sort of all of those animals, as far as I know. Um, given the timeline, which I need to check again now that I crashed and burned a few minutes ago. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, it's the timeline. Um, I propose that we give um, about 10 minutes for that, most. Five more likely, I'll ping everyone five minutes. And then we can do a quick review and then we can move to task two. So with that, I'll stop talking for a bit and I'll ask everyone to provide your feedback and comments directly in the Google document. Okay. Are there any questions uh, before I mute myself? What do you mean by continuous process monitoring? Right, so uh, let me make it slide so again. Uh, the question was, sorry, here. Um, Essentially, the 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 main uh, the continuous monitoring is how this life cycle itself, the MLOps, as I think it's known at some point, um, is monitored. So that the gathering, the processing, the construction of the model, and the evaluation of this whole life cycle is sort of continuously updated, automated as much as possible. This part we'd not even consider at all, because that's kind of a, a meta point. Are there any other questions? All right. If not, I, I, I think oh, it's uh, yes. for this, I think it's worth clarifying that we didn't come up of, uh, with this from scratch, right? That we we it comes from the state of the art. So it's not like we are redefining stuff. Where I th there there has been there have been several life cycles uh, proposed and we just reviewed those and expanded when we thought things were needed needed an expansion yes indeed thanks daniel good to clarify that so if there are no questions i will stop talking i'll mute myself now i'll ask everyone for the next five minutes uh, to add your comments or suggestions directly in the google document and then we'll do a quick round of review and we move on to task force two I, I I quite like the points that are raised. I would also like to ask if there is a particular fair principle definition, data software AI models that is not relevant in any of the steps, just indicate like an X, that there is nothing relevant in this particular 
column or row does need to be there anything. So there are five minutes past. So I'll try to go through a bit of the comments. I see that people are still contributing and I'm not thrilled that I need to cut this short of my with light. Um, but I want to like to go in the comment that was received here. So the comment is that most of the fair principles for data software are not involved until there is something to be shared. And why would this be different for AI models? So, um, I understand the point. My counter argument is mostly that in order to directly apply them and implement them when something is to be shared, some considerations need to be taken into, into, uh, into consideration um, while this data or software or AI model in this particular case is being developed. In other words, if you're starting talking about, I don't know, um, accessibility for uh, for software, um, mm -hmm. some of these aspects on accessibility, we need to start defining from day zero of the software development process itself. Um, same with um, interoperability, for example, for AI models, which, to be honest, I'm not sure how it will uh, ultimately be defined in this particular case. Um, so that's kind of my counter argument to this, this comment. We might need to have different aspects, different letters of the four principles more involved in different steps of this life cycle with the vast majority of them being, of course, in the model sharing, uh, storage and sharing. Daniel, please go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that one of the main problems that we have seen recently also with LLMs is that um, the, the data that has been used for training the model and not for sharing it, for training it, is, is, uh, is very important no? because depending, uh, depending on the new regulations, maybe uh, the model cannot go out. So at least I would say that even before having the model just at training time, uh, this is very important for, for the data availability, right? And that's part of the training process. Fully agree. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so, with, uh, as I have an eye on, so the time, on, on the time itself, um, are there any other comments on this task force one? I know it was quite fast, and the fact that I kind of trust and burn didn't help a lot. Um, but I have one final question, mostly that do you feel that this task force is still kind of on the same track? What we are trying to achieve is still relevant and we are not too much off track. In other case, in other words, do you see some that you've really like hitting your head saying that, oh, this is not wrong, this is not right, you need to fix that already. Or you're not focusing enough on this one, you should be doing that. So Fotis, maybe I'll, I'll just comment that there was a question, I think, while you were off about um, where the writing was actually taking place. And so um, 
So I think it might be worth just thinking about. Um, so if the, the steps that you talked about, I think, are useful, but it might also be worth just saying a little bit about kind of what's actually going to happen going forward and how people can be involved if they want to. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I also see here a point here. Uh, I'll try to summarize this as soon as we move to the next part. So the, um, what Dan was saying is that right now the task force is still work in between um, the monthly calls. And the main goal now that we have, if I go back to the slides, um, different steps here, now that we have at least the life cycle in place since November, and we have this kind of a mapping across the fair principles, the main goal now is to start figure out exactly which of the fair principles are applied to each of those sections. And with a step after that, um, to start drafting the white paper, um, capturing all this information, and clearly indicating, well, the fair principles for AI that are missing. Because as soon as we find the gaps, we can really focus on, on developing these particular elements. So in other words, in the next four or five months, which translates roughly the next four or five community calls, and the expectation is to finish as much as possible with these parts and start focusing a bit more on um, the missing uh, fair principles for AI or AI models or whatever else gaps we'll find through this process, which appear to be most for the AI models themselves. Does this help or is it make it a bit clearer for everyone? And of course, I will get again, encourage people to um, join the group. And uh, again, we try to have these monthly calls as convenient as well, at least every other month. I don't see any other hands or comments coming up. Um, so I think this is the point where I will stop sharing my screen and will yield the floor to Daniel to start with the second task force. All right, thank you very much for this. Um, let me share my screen very quickly and we can get started on the task force overview. <coughs> All right, so I'll try to open the chat at the same time so I can follow up what you're saying. I hope that you can hear me fine because sometimes I have trouble with my microphone and it looks like I'm in, a, in an airplane. Uh, but fortunately that would not, would, would not be the case this time. All right, so let me show you what have been the updates for the second task force. The second task force is uh, focusing on representing machine learning model metadata. Why did we focus on machine learning metadata? Because as you will see in the next presentation, the, uh, the representation of data set metadata for ML has already been addressed by the Croissant uh, Working Group and we wanted to reuse and, and actually suggest following that recommendation for data sets because it's being followed by Hugging Face and uh, OpenML and other machine learning platforms. So we want to uh, basically continue the trend and not reusing uh, and sorry, <laughs> reusing as much as, as we can. And uh, we, we started focusing a little bit on metadata for machine learning models. There is a lot of work in, in this area because we have seen things like the model cards, there are several vocabularies for representing machine learning metadata. And what we did is that we explored these efforts and tried to represent the information following a, a schema.org profile. For those who don't, who are not very familiar with schema.org, is a vocabulary that is commonly used to represent uh, things in the web, and uh, basically it's very nice for findability because once you annotate things over there, then uh, with that, that vocabulary, then um, uh, search engines will identify easily what is it that you are describing. So. Uh, we thought, okay, well, machine learning models are digital resources. Let's build a schema author profile based on that information. And uh, the approach has been to uh, basically uh, do a literature review, including all the control vocabularies that we saw, and then 
create a series of crosswalks against or the proposed vocabulary, getting as a starting point the hugging face cards, uh, ML cards that already exist. Uh, I'm saying a lot of acronyms and, and uh, initiatives, so feel free to stop me at any time. But Hugging Face is a very common platform for sharing machine learning models, and they do have uh, a model card which was uh, basically an attempt by, uh, by, I think, researchers from Google to represent key metadata for machine learning models, right? And the model cards are something like uh, the sections that your readme should have. So with that effort and together with other efforts, because there are a lot of platforms for sharing machine learning models, we have created this uh, core vocabulary and shared uh, and, and done the, the crosswalks, which are the mappings between the equivalent uh, fields of the different platforms. So for example, what you call a maintainer in having face, maybe a contributor in OpenML, right? All right. So basically that is a little bit what we have done and uh, what uh, the efforts i'm gonna try and copy the links in the chat so while i'm presenting so in this first link you can see a small literature review which is not com fully fully complete but it's it's the literature review that we started to do on different uh, vocabularies and efforts that exist for representing machine learning metadata then we have these github repository where we have put the results that we undertook in a hackathon that also leila jael organized and where different experts uh, with expertise in different platforms trying to map them together to see what the different fields in those platforms meant about uh, machine learning models and then what we did is that since both or, uh, two organizations uh, basically uh, by one by Jael and one from me, we uh, we wanted to push forward a first release of the vocabulary to make sure that it had some well that we can gather feedback as soon as possible. Then we started uh, working on different versions which we have mapped together, and now we have like a first very 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 first version of the schema, which is a little rough. Uh, but that you can start seeing over there, it's a JSON LD uh, schema. So it's a, a machine readable representation of the specification. I have to work a little bit on the documentation, and that is why I really wanted to come today with a consultation, consultation open for everyone. But we are not completely ready yet because we have been discussing some of the terms even up to last week. But we will have a consultation and feedback period for the working group to give us feedback about this joint schema. So what does the schema look like? Well, actually, maybe we can have a look at it. Uh, and uh, let me see. Uh, it looks a little ugly because it's a, it's a JSON-LD specification. But as you can see, we borrow a lot of the terms from schema.org to define, well, meta, the key metadata for a machine learning model, such as the description, where, it, where whether there are different distributions, what is the identifier, the funding, right? And some of these also come from the code meta vocabulary, which is a schema or extension as well for um, representing research software metadata, right? So we build on top of these two existing vocabularies and we only add additional things such as um, let me see for well, uh, the eth eth ethical ethical legal and social aspects of the model which data sets has the model based on linking to the croissant uh, vocabulary and so on i am maybe going into a lot of detail but um, I'm going to work next week or in the next couple of weeks on a documentation page that hopefully makes uh, following this a little bit easier for everyone because right now it's in a format that I do understand and, much in, and semantic web people understand but maybe uh, not so much other people so we will try to improve. Um, let me come back to the presentation. So basically, these are all the resources that, that we have been putting up. It's been a lot of work, a lot of discussion, and we hope to have a first, very first version that will, be, will not be complete, of course, 
uh, but at least for, for feedback soon. Um, the next steps that we want to do is to incorporate feedback from the community in, in, uh, from this vocabulary. And, uh, well, I know that RDA, Fotis can correct me or Dan can correct me if I'm wrong, but RDA has concrete mechanisms for uh, uh, doing this consultation and leaving a period open for uh, thoughts and so on. Uh, I believe this is correct, no? For this? Oh, I see yes, you that you're nodding. Correct. Okay, excellent. Uh, of course, we don't have a lot of documentation and examples, which I think are key if, the, if we want people to provide a valuable feedback. And I will we'll be working on this. As I said, uh, we wanted to have them ready for today, but we were still discussing so many aspects of the uh, whether to include a given field or another field that we didn't have enough time. All right. So I wanted to also show uh, a little bit of an example. This is a, a very, uh, well, to give you a glimpse of what uh, the annotation of what of this machine, one of these machine learning models would look like. And uh, what I want to do or what I, I would like to push forward is for an approach that is as simple as possible. And that is uh, follows very similar to the the hugging face model card. So uh, basically, it's a YAML file when you have the different uh, keys of the vocabulary. In this case, the identifier, name, version, and so on. And you fill in this information based on the specification that we we are creating and the examples that we'll create in order to create a machine readable description of your machine learning model. Uh, I added here a dot 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 because there are a lot of metadata fields. Of course, we have to be careful uh, because if we ask too many, maybe people will get burned out. But at the same time, uh, each of these fields supports uh, also a different aspect of fairness. So, for example, if you don't give us the name or the version, it will be very difficult to find the model on the on the web, right? Or if you don't tell us the license, then how how do we know uh, whether people can reuse it or not? No. But just to to show you how it would look like, it would look like uh, having you know a YAML file that it can be easily filled in, and. Uh, well, as I said, then the next activities is just to gather uh, feedback from the community. You can start right now. I, that's why I pasted some of the uh, resources in the uh, in the chat. But specifically, um, what I would like is that if you see that we missed certain uh, vocabularies or, or if you miss, we miss certain platforms that are not yet included either in the literature review or in, in the crosswalks, please let us know so we include them and we plan on doing also a community publication with all this effort uh, in the upcoming months. So I think uh, that's it. I, I think we have a little time for questions and I would like to make sure that if there is anyone who wants to ask anything, please let me know. No questions. Ooh, that's not very good. <clears throat> Lynn, you raise your hand. Uh, yes, thank you so much for all this work. This is amazing. I mean, and the number of uh, the not very many metadata schemas out there for machine learning. So it's it's really uh, important that we we look at what's there. Uh, I had looked earlier at the um, uh, crosswalk and uh, because the community of the science that actually uh, gets uh, started with these efforts or earliest is uh, uh, usually like biology and uh, you know all the different topics of biology. Uh, I'm just wondering if there is a, a, a lot of influence about, uh, uh, especially like for instance, uh, ZV Med um, 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 hackathon that was really focused on biology. And I'm just wondering, you know, how would, we, would it be possible to involve other type of sciences or other communities in this? And that might be a question that's not possible to answer. Some of these other uh, domain sciences, they, 
they want to do their own things usually. <laughs> they don't always want to share. So I, I just wanted to put this out there. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a very good question. In in this first uh, step that we have done at the proposal of the metadata vocabulary, there are no um, commun like uh, domain specific uh, metadata, and that's by design because the idea is that hey, if you want to do this, uh, take this for biology. Um, machine learning models excellent then extend it right or create your own profile or uh, a, now schema.org has this very nice mechanism for including um, control vocabularies so you can even use the control vocabularies from your own domain to identify the application category or maybe the machine learning task because it's only like computer vision is its own <laughs> domain and so on we we try to do this as much as possible but at the same time we are also trying to reach out to uh, researchers from other platforms uh, so for example we have uh, uh, the, not only the croissant uh, talk by Omar today but also we I, I reached out to someone who had been doing um, the representation of all the metadata in uh, hugging face as a structure format and they this will be the second talk so if you are interested about this i encourage you to attend or at least uh, catch up with the second note at uh, the second talk on the 20th that said yeah uh, if you have additional ideas on how to reach out to other people i'm all ears um i've done all i could <laughs> Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Lynn. Um, any other questions or comments? I don't know if if this may be because I went a little bit too too much in detail into some of the aspects. Now I have my head, you know, with all these different initiatives, and I'm so familiar with many of them. So it may be, uh, it it may may be a little overwhelming for listening to this for the first time. Omar, you have your hand up. Yes, hello. Uh, I had a quick question. I was curious uh, when you looked at all the different existing proposals for uh, documenting uh, machine learning models, if you saw any shortcomings or things that were missing from the existing proposals uh, that would be addressed by the, uh, the proposal that you're putting together. Yes, that's uh, an excellent question as well. So we we started we tried to start with the commonalities, like we went through the Hagen phase and also Dome and also well other you can see it in the crosswalks, and uh, and then once we we found the the commonalities we tried to say okay so this platform seems to have uh, these metadata properties and the, they do not have these other metadata properties for example one of the things that surprised us quite significantly is that in hugging phase they do not have versioning proper versioning of models no that each model has a url but uh, they for a given model you don't have like version one version two version three and they did not have metadata to represent this which to me is a little shocking no but maybe depending on on what they uh, depending it depends on what they want to do um, <clears throat> as shortcomings i also did an other effort from um, on an initiative that we have here we have a national project that is designed to creating a lot of machine learning models and we went through a process of uh, get, gathering the requirements from model, machine learning engineers and then also see what was uh, what were the things that were missing that were not represented now neither in schema or or in hugging face cards and those are the new things that we are proposing the extension of um, so if you go to the to the JSON scheme, the JSON LD specification, which I apologize again because it's not, I didn't have time for documenting it, you'll see that there we add a, a few properties, for example, to indicate, ah, oh, yeah, this model was uh, trained with this data set, but it was evaluated with this other data set, right? And some other new properties that were not in schema or um and uh, well some of them were in in the other platforms does that answer your question uh, 
Thank you. Excellent. All right, Lynn, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was wondering if it would be worth a discussion, and maybe it's not, uh, you know, it's it's not something that. So, but that would also apply to the um, the machine learning life cycle. Is that uh, like to uh, you know to what extent to do large language models have specifications that we might not have captured or that are already captured in what we're doing? In which case, you know, they're just machine learning models anyway. Uh, so this is something that I think maybe is. It's worth discussing, and it might not be for today. It might be for one of our uh, later session. I just wanted to placeholder for this. Yeah, th that's right. And and the interesting thing about LLMs also is that they evolve quite rapidly, and and they bring in some requirements that we didn't have even seven months ago. I had never heard about model quantization before, and it turns out that now in the last year, it, it's something that is, that at least my, my ML engineers, they tell, well, they, sorry, not mine, <laughs> the, the ML engineers in my organization, they tell me that is one of the key aspects that they look at whenever they are uh, looking to use a certain model, because if it, it basically gives a, gives you gives away whether it can be easily deployed or you are going to need a huge infrastructure for deploying that model. No? So and this is a metadata field that, uh, well, in October we knew maybe about it, but six months before we didn't. So yeah, um, if you if you the, the nice thing about this is that the the activity of gathering requirements it's also public. I we didn't put it in the in the repository yet, but we we can add like all the questions and how these questions can be answered by the current metadata vocabulary. Um, and that way, if we want to grow it or evolve it with new requirements, that's also a way for everyone to contribute saying, hey, I think this is not captured. Maybe we should add a new metadata field. So I think that's a very good point. Um, yeah. Yeah. If I can jump in for the life cycle and what we just mentioned, um, actually, when we were discussing the different steps of the life cycle, we did consider the LLMs, especially the part of refinement of the model and be using it as part of, you know, to go back and fine tune it. Because any other type of model uh, in the life cycle itself, it's quite hard to go back and produce other data and do a different process. You basically retrain the whole thing. So you're not reusing the model. You're taking the idea of the model and go back and recreating it. So some parts of the life cycle of LLM was were introduced in the life cycle that we put together during the, by the, the mini hackathon. Uh, but I, as Daniel said, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are additional elements that are very unique to LLMs that might not fit rather well in the life cycle. Yeah, so that's really interesting because uh, the, the, the picture of the data life cycle, I showed it to uh, some of the uh, people who do machine learning in my, uh, in my organization and uh, you know, because we we wanted to use a, a smaller, you know, a reduced version, and uh, I asked them the same question, and they said, "Oh no, no, my, my, uh, langu large language models they fit under this. We don't have to add anything to it." So there's there's like you know opinions basically, and like like uh, uh, Daniel said, uh, there's this evolution uh, that might you know that might might uh, we might want to capture at some point. Awesome. Thanks. Mm, oh, I see a comment from Moran. Do you want to uh, maybe? Yes, elaborate? thank you, Daniel. Yes, no, just uh, putting a link in so you have that in your radar, even though it's not very uh, fair for ML, but it is about openness and uh, transparency. So if you don't know the um, uh, Software Heritage uh, statement on LLM, um, here's the link. Yes. Thank you, Daniel. I think I, I heard that now, didn't Software Heritage now have their own LLM? <laughs> In... well, <laughs> well, this not, is a very big such... data set. It's a very big data set, right, uh, Software Heritage. And I can also link the, um, um, well, I, I will link some, some other news uh, in there. Uh, 
and related to hugging face, actually. All right. Um, uh, Florina, do you want to uh, maybe elaborate on your comments in the chat? Hi. Um, yes and no. So I, because I, I don't want to to um, comment too much on the model cards because I only looked at a couple of them and uh, I think you did a really great job to collect all that information. Uh, but to connect it to to Lynn's comment earlier, uh, we we don't want these model cards to be only for those researchers or programmers or ML engineers who created them. Yeah, so that that that's why I uh, I I'm sad that the having face model cards they are created by those very <laughs> expert ML guys working with neural networks and LLMs for the same uh, group of people. So whoever works in that domain and reads that model card will, will understand immediately what it is about and so on. Um, when they uh, when they link to the to the code, uh, which is maybe on a GitHub, then there is versioning there as well. Uh, so you, you can, there is an implicit versioning there as well, but still we don't want these model cards to be visible and understand, uh, understand understood by of a small group of people working in that particular domain only. So it would we, we need to look at at what usages machine learning models have, like in bioinformatics when they do um, machine learning, maybe even very simple machine learning algorithms from neural networks point of view. Uh, um, but um, we would need to look at those usages and uh, integrate those in our our fair for ml schemas yeah um i think i think you're right um i, I do not think i have anything against uh, what you said it is true i mean what uh, that comment I mean, it, it can be said uh, the same for software no like i i have these these uh, RSCs that are working in this community and the rhythms can only understood, uh, be understood by them. But then uh, they are not, I mean, it, we should aim to be better than that because otherwise even if they can be found, then only a very small subset of people can use them, no? Yeah, and that's why in the in the model cards, no, well, not only the model cards, but in the fair for ml schema, we, we try to capture also part of the process. Uh, the vocabulary is very uh, is very model centric in the sense that everything revolves about model metadata, because the metadata of the data sets, for example, is already captured by Crasan, so I, we didn't want to go into there that much. And also because if you start going into the processes too much, then the people filling in the model car get a little overwhelmed, so we have to find the balance. Um, but this will be only the first, uh, of course, the first version. We can we can expand. All right. Um, any any other comments or questions? I think we are we are uh, we are al it's almost time for us to move to the invited talk. So I think I'll do that. And uh, today we have Omar Vengelum from uh, Google and uh, he will be presenting uh, the Grassine, the Grassan dataset, uh, machine learning dataset specification, which is a recent, well, recent from a couple months ago. I, I'm sure that even with a, after a lot of discussions, uh, but uh, it's a specification for representing uh, data sets that are having used in uh, training or evaluating uh, models by extending also schema.org. So we have also this connection to the work that we have been doing. So I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, Omar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so I just need to manage to share my screen. Sorry, just one second. I'm used to uh, the Google chat application, uh, video conferencing application, not Zoom too much these days, which is why uh, <laughs> it's not as natural for me. Uh, all right, 
Can you all see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so hi everyone. So my name is Omar uh, Benjaloun. I'm a software engineer at Google. Uh, my day job is to work on the Google Dataset Search team, which is a team in research building a search engine for datasets. So we crawl and index all uh, web pages that contain schema.org slash dataset markup or DCAT, uh, and, and then we exp expose them through uh, uh, dataset search and also on, on Google search. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the authors of the croissant format uh, specification, uh, which is uh, a format we developed as part of the ML Commons working group that involves people from uh, lots of different places, both uh, companies like Google and Hugging Face, and also uh, academia and uh, organizations like OpenML uh, and, and so on. Um, yeah, so uh, today I'll tell you a bit about the croissant format. And also, yeah, feel free to interrupt me during the presentation if you have any, any questions. So we set out with the goal to help machine learning users with data sets. As you're uh, familiar with uh, uh, ML practitioners, spend a lot of efforts uh, working with data and preparing data and finding the right data and uh, using it to train their models and evaluate their models. And, and so they spend a lot of time on these tasks, uh, but there's a lot of friction in, in, in working with, with data for, for machine learning practitioners, right? Uh, so we set out with the goal to, to help machine learning users with data sets. And so our first question was, okay, what is special about the data that is used for machine learning? Uh, and these are some of the characteristics we identified is that, you know, you have both uh, unstructured data, uh, like text and images and video, as well as structured data, uh, like tabular data, JSON, and sometimes even combinations of, of structured, unstructured data that is used for uh, training models. Uh, we also saw that most uh, uh, data loaders or frameworks that people use to do their machine learning uh, rely on the data being kind of flattened or denormalized into a, a set of records uh, before it can be loaded into uh, into sort of the, the the tools for training and so on. Uh, and and also we realized that you know you need some metadata that is really specific to machine learning. Like okay, how do you uh, well versioning is not machine learning specific, but it's very important. Like you need to know uh, that uh, you, you, which version uh, of the data set you're working with, but also things like uh, uh, responsible AI uh, information and how to split your data into test train and validation splits. And also uh, information about labels and how they were uh, curated and, 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 and their distribution and meaning and, and so on. Right? Um, so, so we came up with the, the idea of uh, creating a format that is dedicated for machine learning uh, for helping uh, make data sets ML ready. And so that's the, the croissant format. And you know because schema.org slash data set is one of the most widely adopted vocabularies for, for data sets, probably the most, the most widely adopted, uh, uh, we decided to base our work on uh, on schema.org. And so we essentially extended schema.org slash data set uh, with the missing information, uh, if you like. Uh, and we organized the croissant format into four different layers, right? So there's a layer, and I'll give you some examples uh, in, in a bit. So the first layer is really uh, data set level metadata. And this is an extension of, of uh, schema.org slash data set with additional fields that might be missing from. Um, from from this uh, vocabulary uh, uh, that 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 uh, that are needed for ML datasets, uh, and then uh, the second layer is a description of the resources. So even though schema.org has a, a way to specify a distribution or a data download, it's actually not uh, precise enough to uh, describe in detail this, the contents of your dataset. So we we added this layer for resource description. And then the, the layer we added on top of that called content structure is one that really describes the, the, the schema, if you like, of your data, like the organization of like the columns of your tables, or if you have 
a set of like uh, structured data, the layout of the files in, in archives or directories and so on. Uh, and then and, and how, do, how you can map those into sort of a common representation that makes it easy to load the data into, into your machine learning framework. And finally, the, there's a layer to represent uh, um, semantic information, in particular, uh, machine learning semantics like labels, test change, splits, uh, and so on. But also a way, ways to map to uh, other vocabularies like, you know, how to describe uh, uh, geospatial data or, or, or data from specific domains that have existing vocabularies. Uh, and so the benefits we saw to creating this, this common format are, and here you recognize a lot of things that are have to do with, uh, with, with fair attributes, uh, is one is to create a homogeneous corpus that contains uh, a lot of a lot of data sets uh, which makes it uh, you know easy to work with any of the data sets that you find that are in this format and also improves search and discovery and reuse of data sets uh, obviously uh, and the second benefit is around interoperability of tools right uh, if all data set repositories and all machine learning frameworks and all the tools that you want to use in your workflow all speak the same language and the same uh, understand the same representation of data sets, then it's very easy to do things like, oh, I found a data set on Hugging Face and I'm going to use it with you know, the uh, Kaggle learning platform. Or uh, it doesn't matter what uh, loader or what uh, machine learning framework I want to use. If it's PyTorch or TensorFlow or JAX, uh, I can use any of those because they all have loaders that work with this format. Uh, and so on. And, uh, over time, we hope that even tools like, you know, uh, uh, analysis tools, visualization tools, labeling tools, and so on, uh, if they start understanding and working uh, with this format, then it, they become interoperable with, uh, with, with your data sets. Right? And as a result, we think that this will help machine learning users spend much less time, uh, you know, on data-related tasks and instead focus on, on, on uh, developing and evaluating their, their models. All right, so this is a visual overview of the kind of things that we uh, you can do already today with, with Croissant. So at the top right here, uh, you can search for data sets on Dataset Search, and there's a Croissant filter that lets you uh, see only the data sets that are available in the Croissant format. Uh, and then if you go to the left, you can then download from any of the platforms that support Croissant. You can directly download the metadata of the data set in the croissant format, whether it's on Hugging Face or Kaggle or OpenML. Uh, and then if you want to work with data set, uh, with your data set at the bottom left, uh, bottom right here, uh, you can use uh, some of the loaders that already support the croissant format, so, such as the TensorFlow data sets loader uh, that, give, that gives you access to both TensorFlow and PyTorch and JAX uh, uh, loaders for your data. And if you want to inspect or create a new a croissant definition for your data set, then we have a visual editor tool uh, that is an open source editor that you can use to, um, to, to, to create your data set and helps you essentially define the metadata of your, of your data set. Uh, we also uh, spent quite a bit of effort uh, on, on uh, responsible AI aspects because we thought that these are uh, really important for data sets that are used in machine learning. And I don't think I need to convince uh, you of this, of this importance. Uh, and, and we thought that, you know, if we support responsible AI uh, attributes uh, in the croissant format, then uh, this will help users find data sets that have the right characteristics for the problem that they're trying to uh, to, to, to solve uh, in terms of responsible AI. And also, uh, if you look at models that were trained using specific data sets and you know what their uh, responsible AI characteristics, then you can derive some information about the responsible AI characteristics of the, of the models themselves. Uh, and so we essentially defined a... Uh, a, a uh, extension of the core croissant format, which is the this responsible AI vocabulary that we released together with the croissant format. And, and to develop that, we did something similar to what you were describing, Daniel, earlier, which is, well, we looked at all the existing uh, vocabularies that people have created, whether it's like uh, data cards uh, from Hugging Face, uh, data sheets, uh, and, and, and all others. And we also looked at like, you know, what's common between them, uh, nutrition labels, and so on. What's what's common between them? What's different? Uh, and and how to? What are the most important attributes that should be in a vocabulary? And we also organized it around uh, what we thought were the most important uh, use cases around data from a responsible AI uh, perspective, which are which are listed here, like the lifecycle of the data, how the data was labeled, is this a you know 
uh, crowdsource uh, data set and how does that process go, safety and fairness and, and compliance and so on, right? Uh, and then in order to help users work with these with this responsible AI vocabulary, we essentially extended the visual editor that we created for Croissant to have uh, tools to help users define um, uh, responsible AI attributes visually instead of writing JSON-LD, which is not a very uh, user-friendly uh, way to work. Uh, I'll just finish by giving you a quick uh, taste of what Croissant looks like. Uh, so this is uh, this essentially the data set level metadata of, a day of, of the past data set. Uh, so this is essentially schema.org slash data set in JSON-LD format. Uh, so these are all, all the attributes here come from schema.org, so we're not reinventing uh, anything. One of the attributes we added is cite as, uh, so CR, the CR prefix stands for croissant. And so this is how to cite this, this specific data set. Schema.org happens to have a citation uh, property, but that property is for works that are cited from this data set, not information about how to cite this data set specifically, which is a bit a bit confusing. Um, the next layer is how do you describe the resources contained in your data set, right? Uh, so there are two types of resources you can have in a, da in a data set. Uh, the first one is individual files, which we call file objects. So here in this past data set, you have uh, one metadata file, which is a CSV file that contains features about uh, images, uh, and then the images themselves, which are contained in uh, uh, an archive file, a tar file here, uh, called pass.0.tar. In fact, there are nine such files that pass0, pass1, to pass9. Uh, so this is how you describe the individual files. Uh, and then the second type of resource is the metadata file, which contains features about images, and then the images themselves, which are contained in an archive file, a tar file here, uh, called pass.0.tar. In fact, there are nine such files that pass0, pass1, to pass9. So this is how you describe the individual files. Constructs to describe groups of files or sets of files, which we call file set, and this essentially lets you uh, look inside this this archive and say, oh, inside this archive, uh, it's inside these nine archives actually, which are concatenated here, uh, there are about there is a bunch of JPEG images, and just so go and find everything that is uh, star.jpg inside this archive, and this gives you will give you a set of images that you can uh, set of files that you can that you can work with. Uh, so this is these are the only constructs needed to describe the resources. And what we found is like for uh, a large number of data sets that we worked with, that we used as examples that you can find on our GitHub, uh, these, these, these constructs were sufficient to describe them. Uh, and then finally, the last layer I want to talk about is this kind of structure layer. So the text is getting smaller. I hope it's still, uh, it's still readable. Uh, so this layer essentially defines uh, what we call record sets. So record set is like an abstraction, it's like a schema abstraction that defines a set of records uh, where each of the records, uh, all the records have the same fields, if you like. So you can think of the fields of a record set as the columns of a table, and you can also have nesting. So this also allows you to describe hierarchical record sets. Right? Uh, and in this particular example, what we're doing, still from the same past example, is uh, we're uh, using, we're creating uh, denormalizing flat records that contain both the images and the metadata or the features uh, fields that are extracted from the CSV file. So essentially, we're saying, okay, there's a field here which is the image content uh, on the on the left here, uh, which is you know just extracted from the file set that we defined earlier that contains the, the all the all the images, uh, and then in order to join with the CSV file, you need to uh, extract the hash of each image, which is the identifier of each image, and that hash is actually contained in the file name uh, of the image. So the file name of each image is the hash.jpg. So there's a regular expression here that's used to extract just the hash. And once we have the hash, we can say, oh, now this is also a foreign key, if you like, in database correspondence uh, terminology. This is a foreign key to the column image hash in the metadata CSV file. And this allows us then to bring the additional properties from the CSV file, like the creator name and the GPS coordinates, like latitude and longitude where the picture is taken. So this is kind of like a mini schema language that lets you extract information from both structured and unstructured uh, uh, files and, sometimes, and combine it together. Uh, and this creates a representation that you can then use to directly load the data into your uh, favorite machine learning uh, framework. Um, so like we developed this as, 
in parallel with the loaders for uh, some of the loaders for machine learning uh, frameworks in order to verify that this was indeed sufficient to work with, uh, with these formats. All right, uh, so this is my last slide. So this is where we are today. So we launched the specification and uh, along with the support in Hugging Face Kaggle and OpenML, who worked closely with us uh, to, to make this happen. It actually turned out that this was not a very large engineering effort on any of these platforms because they all already have some structured representation of metadata and resources and the schemas of their tables uh, internally in their platforms. So it was mostly about converting that metadata into, into a shared format and then exposing it in uh, you know, JSON-LD form uh, on a platform. Uh, we also have the ability to filter these data sets in data set search. And we are providing an open source library to work with croissant files, which is available on our GitHub repo, uh, as well as uh, the visual editor. Uh, and there's support in TensorFlow datasets, which gives you access to TensorFlow, JAX, and PyTorch, and also a native loader that's being developed uh, for PyTorch. And in terms of repositories, there's also um, support that is uh, being developed for the, um, uh, for, um, Sorry, I'm blanking out. Uh, the the um, uh, another uh, important dataset platform, and sorry, my memory is not working right now. That that will be available uh, soon. As this is all developed in an open working group uh, under the ML Commons uh, umbrella. If you are interested in this effort, uh, please join us. We have uh, weekly uh, community calls and a very active uh, GitHub community where uh, where we do all our all our development. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Omar. That was really, really, really useful. I, I think I have like a million questions, but I'm also mindful of the time that we have five minutes left. Um, so I will directly yield the floor to anyone who might have questions from the audience. I, I do have one. Uh, well, the the rest of the people think about the question so you mentioned that uh, you reviewed the like the common vocabularies that were used for representing uh, ml data sets and so on do you have a link to this effort or is this captured anywhere because i think i was not able to find it when i was looking and it would be incredibly useful for part of the work that we also are planning to do because we yeah, wanted we to use this representation? I think maybe the best place to look is, so we published a short paper about that just gives a general overview of the croissant in the uh, DEEM workshop at, at the, next to SIGMOD, uh, which which is happening uh, soon. So the, the paper was accepted, but it, it's, it's, it's also, the paper is also on, I can, I can, uh, uh, put a link to the to the paper in the in the notes, uh, and I think the, the related work section has like a brief overview of uh, comparison to other uh, other formats, uh, and and I mean we also have some internal notes. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to I'm happy to answer those offline. Thank, Thank you. you. Posting the link to the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also have well, I have a, a few. The technical questions, but I'm not sure if they are going to go a little bit too deep for the scope of this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, but one in general that um, I think I open an issue about this, which is about the the specification itself uh, does not resolve to to the uh, to the specific the machine readable uh, JSON LD file, right? So yeah. that's why you had this raw uh, in the loader. You had this raw GitHub link instead of. Uh, is is there a reason for this, or maybe it's something that you guys did not consider yet, like adding proper content negotiation on on the uh, specification? Because you have a very nice yeah. URL, but I think that's a great suggestion. I think I think we should. That is just something we we haven't considered. I think we could we 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 should follow your suggestion and add the content negotiation. Uh, description so that it, it it resolves to the to the right place. All right, I have other questions, but I want to leave the the floor for other people. Uh, is there, there is, anyone? There is one also? question in the chat. Are there any efforts, plans, or ideas to bring Rasna definitions into mainline schema.org definitions? 
that that's a that's a great question. So we actually, I mean, I, uh, I we work pretty closely with uh, people on the schema.org effort, and I think at least initially it was it didn't really make sense to develop this uh, vocabulary directly inside schema.org because it's kind of like more specialized and it's also more technical and a bit deeper than the rest of schema.org, which is often describes things things that are for like you know webmasters to annotate their you know products and events uh, and and things like that uh, in the long run uh, i think it's 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 a good it's a good question i think if it's as long as we're focused primarily on uh, machine learning data sets maybe this is uh, this is kind of specific uh, but if if this format uh, finds a more uh, general usefulness with with uh, data sets in other communities like know, open government data sets or uh, scientific data sets or uh, geospatial data sets and so on then maybe maybe we could revisit the whether it makes sense to have it be part of of, of schema.org i think another aspect to this is while we started by building on schema.org i think there are other vocabularies to do, to describe data sets like dcat for instance uh, and uh, and and I think it would be interesting also to see, you know, what's the relationship to DCAT and is there how do you do the same kind of things that we do in Croissant uh, on top of Schema.org? How how do you do that on top of on top of DCAT, which is uh, also an important vocabulary for for representing dataset metadata. I think in the case for DCAT, they are already aligned. So a DCAT dataset is a Schema.org dataset, right? So. Um, in that sense, it's done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the DCAT also has like its own way of defining extensions, uh, and and I think I think that's and we actually have some early discussions with people on the working on DCAT to to see like okay now how what's and then I think there's also efforts on like DCAT for ML on like how do you define ML data sets uh, in, in DCAT so I think there's more more discussion and, and potential collaboration uh, I see I see what you mean the DCAT profiles right so yeah, yeah. Oh, okay yeah I understand I understand what you mean hmm, that, that would be interesting indeed Right, I think we are on time and we need to wrap up. Um, so the, the last point uh, before we wrap up the call from my side is that uh, there's going to be a repeat call of, of, of today's session on the 21st. Uh, so we check out the, the, slide, the schedule for that. Um, there's going to be a different kind of invited talk, but this session day has been recorded, so you can always um, revisit this discussion. Um, if you have any other ideas of new task force that you want to be involved, or if you're willing to call it any of the tasks, please feel free to indicate that into the collaborative notes. notes in any case. Um, and if you want to be part of the discussion in any case, we have the fair for ig interest group and the mailing list, so please join and be part of the community. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. I'm sorry for being one minute late. Uh, thanks also to Omar for the invited speaker um, and Daniel for co-chairing this and Dan for saving me when everything crossed. And I'll see you all in one of the uh, future calls of the RDA. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.